official Jets podcast is presented by WinBet. Betting is a team sport, but together at WinBet, Eric Allen here at One Jets Drive, joined by Albert Greer of SI.com, of course, Monday morning quarterback. Albert, 20 teams you've seen so far this summer. Yeah. What's it been like, the travels? Um, good. I, I mean, I'm actually – well, this one's like a, a little bit difficult just because I had an early fight this morning. But uh, I actually have been off the road for about a week now. Um, I did 16 of them in, I don't know, 15 days or something like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a good opportunity to see people and kind of get an idea of what's happening with every team. And, um, you know, it's like sort of the lifeblood of what I do is just, you know, my connections, my relationships right. and all of that. Like, so... It's an important time of year from that standpoint, for sure. What have been some of your major takeaways so far? Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, you know, on an individual team basis, you know, a lot of people have asked me who I, I think is going to be better than people realize. You know, Atlanta and Seattle would be two teams that I've sort of picked out as, I think those two are going to be pretty good, and I don't think very many people are paying attention to them, probably mostly because of the quarterbacks there. Um, you know, Kansas City, Mahomes is Mahomes. They're rolling. San Francisco's roster right. is positively loaded. Like you just, you go out to one of their practices and it's just dude after dude after dude. And when I was there, you know, their best player, Nick Bosa, wasn't even there. Um, so like there are some like individual team observations. I mean, one of my observations that kind of goes back to what happened here is it seems like there have been a lot of fights this summer. <laughs> like, and I don't know why. It's weird. Maybe it was like that heat wave that we all got where it was 100 degrees out. But right. But it feels like there's been more and more fights. And I, I know I even know it's the point where there was a team. There's a couple teams that are, um, you know, doing joint practice this week where the team hosting, the head coach, called the other head coach and said, we're not doing one-on-ones with you because they had gotten into fights in a previous mm. set of joint practices in their one-on-ones. So uh, that's just an observation. I, there's nothing scientific behind that. Like right. it's, not like I've count, it's not like I have a tally of the number of fights, but it feels like there's been a lot do, of them. Do you think that's been a change uh, when you go back? Because you've been uh, covering a league for a little while. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I Maybe it's... You know, maybe it's like oh, another one of the remnants of COVID, you know, like because that first summer in 2020, obviously nobody was doing joint practice. I feel like were there none or maybe just a lot less in 21. And so, you know, what people don't realize is how much of the league is third and fourth, the guys in their in their first three or four years, like almost right. the entire league. You know, there are very few guys that actually make it past um, three or four years. And then, you know, when you get to training camp, there's a 90 man roster every, on every team. I don't know what the number is, but a huge majority are young guys. So maybe it's, and I'm just kind of like workshopping this in my head now, but, you know, maybe it is like that there are a lot of guys who don't know how to handle themselves in these situations. Yeah, I don't know. How how have teams reacted to the one cut down now? That's a big time difference than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, I I don't know the cut downs. Like, I, I, I think it's cleaner, it's easier. I think the way it was done before was in part to, like, it was, I think it was about that fourth preseason game. Now, you can look at it both ways, whether it's cleaning up who plays, making it simpler for coaches to kind of do the assessment of who's playing, or making it harder for teams to not play starters, which, you know, the league might be trying to do. Um, When you had that fourth preseason game that was, for everyone, just such a throwaway. Like, that was... I would argue like the fourth preseason game was like one of the worst product, one of the worst entertainment products out there, <laughs> right? I, I don't think anybody's going to argue against <laughs> it that. It was a terrible product. Yeah. And uh and so like I I I think that there were rules in place like with the cuts that related to the fourth preseason game that no longer have to exist. I and I do think it's like probably better for the players and knowing there's one date and that's it. Like psychologically it's just you're playing to one date and that's it. Um, And then for the teams on the other side of it, like you do know who your team is earlier, you know, you know, you know, instead of that Saturday after the fourth preseason game, now you sort of know, I think it's Tuesday or Wednesday, which probably allows you to better prepare for week one. And then you have the expanded practice squad, of course. Uh, You mentioned dudes before you saw you've seen a lot of dudes here this summer. But what do you think about those that reside here in Florham Park wearing green and white? Yeah, there's I mean. Look, like I, I think a big part of it is um, you have to have a good team to attract a quarterback like the one they attracted here. And that was sort of the hidden thing about Tampa. You know, a lot of people were like, whoa, Tom Brady went to Tampa. 
look at the other team that he was looking at was the Chargers, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people knew, like, oh, well, the Chargers, they lose Phillip Rivers. You pluck the quarterback out of there. Is it, like, are they just a quarterback away? And then they draft Justin Herbert. They didn't get Brady. We see it's, like, sort of worked out that way. And I right. think it was sort of the same thing with the with the Bucks. Uh, people didn't see it at the time because they hadn't made the playoffs in a long time. But Brady's looking at that roster, and he sees Levante David, and he sees Carlton Davis, and he sees, um, you know, he sees Donovan Smith, and he sees – Mike Evans and he sees Chris Godwin yeah. and you st- and like you know part of his process was I could be the difference there and then he was and so I think that's part of you know where the Jets are the longest playoff trip throughout in the league I think but it's sort of similar where Aaron like probably you know and I know Aaron looks at the roster and said there's a lot of good players there and so I think that that's a huge part of it now you know I, I think the other advantage Brady had that, that Rodgers has too is you know Brady knew all right like they've got like the franchise cornerstone players you know and i believe it was no they already had devin white right like they already had devin white and they drafted tristan Wirfs, mm. and um but brady knew like all right like the foundation pieces are in place and i can kind of go get some of my guys in here to supplement that it's sort of the same thing here where um you know like you look at the jets roster you have the number one receiver you have the number one corner you have the pass rusher it's not an edge rusher but it's an interior guy in quinn and williams you have the middle linebacker you have a lot of like foundational pieces and he could come in here and he could bring some of his guys with him. Obviously Lazard's here, Cobb's here mm-hmm. um, to fill in the blanks and kind of complete the team. What does he have to be here? Not just for the Jets to be a playoff team, but thought of as a contender. I mean, I think they're already a contender. You do. Um, because they were seven and four last year and the bottom fell out and, like considering how bad the quarterback situation was last year, it's amazing they even got to seven to four. It's sort of a testament to the rest of the roster. And that's no offense to, you know, to Zach Wilson or Joe Flacco or any of the other guys, but it was just it was what it was. It was a mess, you know. And so the fact they were even get able to get to get, get to seven and four before the bottom fall, fell out, I think, is sort of indicative of what the roster can be. So, like, I don't think Aaron needs to be Superman. I think he needs to be Aaron Rodgers, and. I think that that's probably going to take some time. Mm. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people forget that there were fits and starts at the beginning for Brady. And when you've got a guy who's been doing things his way for so long, one way for so long, and then he's thrown into a new environment, and now, all right, like, how do we do this? How do we do this? How do we do this? They're going through all of that in the spring and summer, but then there's also the element of, when you get to the fall, some of that stuff's not going to work. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so you're going to stub your toe, and some things are going to go wrong, and you're still going to be building the relationships, and you're going to have to do things by fire. And so, you know, I think it's be Aaron Rodgers and be steady. And when things don't go right, and when things don't go the way you envisioned them when you were trying to get yourself traded in March and April, mm-hmm. don't panic. And kind of be the guy to steer the ship. And there's that famous story um, from Tampa's championship year in 2020. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Eric, but, you know, like there was during the bye week, uh, Brady and B.A. went and played golf. Hmm. And I think that they, they may have gotten e- they may have even gotten in trouble for it. Like because <laughs> it was like the covid thing or whatever. I can't remember exact exactly what the what the details of that yeah. part of it were. But that was sort of when they turned over some things and it became Brady's operation. And so much of what Brady had done in New England, it was like, OK, like when I came in. I knew, like, the terminology was just going to, if I went in and ran BA system, the terminology was just going to work for, like, the, everybody in the building knew BA's terminology right. because he'd been there. So if we keep it the same, then I'm the only one who has to adjust. So, like, then they get to the bye week and it's, okay, like, here's some things that I think we should do differently that I was doing in New England that's going to make me a better player and that I think we can adapt to what we're doing. And then they didn't lose again. So It's kind of like the opposite here, though, right? Because he's the player coach and he knows the system. and and But there's going to be some adjustment. Right. You know what I mean? Like, And there is some, you know, I think there's some similarities between what Michael Floor and, 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 uh, and, and Nathaniel Hackett, like, do offensively. But there's going to be an adjustment, too. And no matter how you slice it, there's the melding of those things, you know. And the quarterback's such a big part of it. And when you have a quarterback that's done it one way forever, it's either the rest of 
everybody everybody else catches up to him or he catches up to everybody mm-hmm. and there is going to be some push and pull on that and i don't know that you can really judge that after a month or after two months go look at peyton manning start in denver like you know like it's it's it could take time right and i think that that's part of it and yeah. i think that that like on for Aaron, I think it's on Aaron to be sort of the steady ship when it's like, you know, you've got young guys like Garrett Wilson and Brees Hall who are probably out here and being like, wow, this is incredible. Yeah. And then when it's not a rocket ship in September, like they're the ones that maybe need you to say, just give it time. We're going to get there. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because Brady, of course, did that in Tampa. What do you make of the tension here on this organization right now? Not just throughout the summer, but what we're going to see early in the season. Yeah, so there's going to be pressure. There's no question about that. God, I'm a mess. See, that's the 6 a.m. flight kicking in. Um, Yeah, there's going to be the pressure. And every game is going to be litigated as Yeah, September 12th, you're either either going to the Super Bowl. And I think, you know, the fact that, like, these players have played in New York helps, the guys that Aaron's joining, and then – you know, I kind of laugh when people say, like, oh, well, the New York media. If you go in the locker room in Green Bay, Wisconsin, <laughs> on a normal Wednesday of the regular season, I promise you the number of media in there is not that different. And the reason why is because Green Bay itself may be a small market. Every news outlet in Wisconsin is covering them day to day. And not only are they, are they covering them, they are number one and number one by a mile. Right. And so, like, the intensity of the coverage in Green Bay is there, you know. So um, I think for both sides, for both the Jets players, the existing players who are back, and Aaron himself, um, it's going to be ratcheted up, and there's going to be another level of it because of, like, the spotlight that's on these guys. But I do think to some degree they should already be – they should already be conditioned to it based on their own pa- per- past experiences. And – I think, you know, a huge part of the veteran quarterback's job, I'll go right back to that, a huge part of the veteran quarterback's job in that is to be like sort of the steady ship in choppy waters. And when things get choppy, don't allow it to get to you that, you know, at 10 a.m. on ESPN, again, they're litigating week three like it's the Super Bowl. Do you like the marriage of Rodgers and Robert Sala? Because yeah. we've, we've talked about Sala in the past, but the way he kind of, connects to the players it remains a positive presence and i think he's gonna uh, preach uh, something in terms of staying in the moment to his players during the season because he knows what's ahead yeah and i think you know robert's experience having been on super bowl staffs before having gone through it in seattle and having gone through it in san francisco and being on the defensive side and understanding how the whole thing comes together um, I mean, look, like there was tension in Seattle, like, and everybody knows it now. It was real when they right. were there, you know, and like that was part of the program, you know, like in a way, like the competitiveness, the juice, a lot of it was like almost spilling over all the time. Um, and, you know, his experience in San Francisco, of course, with, you know, a team that was built from the ground up, like that was when Kyle and John got there in 2017, that was a complete teardown. Like that was from, so I think understanding every step of that and understanding what goes into that and understanding kind of what it takes to take that last step and turn yourself into a Super t- Super Bowl team is going to inform Robert on how he handles everything this year. And, like, I do think, like, the fact that he's sort of a walk-around head coach and a CEO head coach and he's entrusted a lot of, like, the defensive stuff to Jeff Elbrick, not saying he's not involved, but... Like, obviously he is, but he's, like, sort of, like, the the guy in front of the team is going to help, too, because he's going to be able to manage a lot of the things that come along and all the bumps that, you know, inevitably you're going to hit in an NFL season. You mentioned Brady before. You covered him for decades. What are the significant similarities between the two guys as far as players and people, him and Rodgers, and then maybe the most significant differences? Um well, they're both from California. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> they grew up about two hours apart. Um, yeah, you know, I'd say um, I'd say there's a similar chip on the shoulder where um, personality-wise, where you know, I think there's 
it sort of fuels the competitiveness for both guys. Um, and I do think for Brady, it's a little bit more, <laughs> I think for Brady, it's a little bit more competing against himself, you know, and it's become competing against himself where with Rogers, it's like he needs an enemy sometimes, you know? So like, I guess that would be a difference. Um, I, I think their command yeah. is similar. And I think that the way that the people who are beneath them talk about them is similar. And, you know, I, I, I've always felt with both those guys, like you walk into one of the buildings that they're in, Green Bay for Brady or for, for Rogers, and obviously Tampa and New England for, for Brady, and there will be some person in that building nobody's ever heard of who people wouldn't even understand what their job is, who's got something nice to say about them. Um, and both those guys have sort of, <laughs> when they've had friction in their organizations, it's been punching up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so... Like, I think that that would be another similarity. Um, play style is very different, of course. Well, of course, you know, yeah. But, but I do think, like, there's a a knowledge and a command over everything that's going on out there that they both have and an understanding of the ebbs and flows of the game. Um, obviously, Brady has six more rings. So, like, there is something with Brady and the way that he performs on every stage, on, on the biggest stage, almost always at his best that is i think incomparable in all of sports i mean it's like michael jordan michael jordan you know what i mean it's yeah. michael jordan it's like no matter what like that guy when you can count on it if it's a big game you may not win every one of them but you're gonna get like a a plus effort from him right. you know um but yeah i mean there are probably more similarities and differences i'm rambling a little bit now no, I, I, I like it. i like the jordan comparison <laughs> Jets fans, we're in our final push and the clock is ticking. WinBet is giving you a golden opportunity to win VIP prizes for the 2023 season. The WinBet Green Room is the most exclusive space at the stadium with all-inclusive food and beverage, lower-level seats, and appearances by Jets legends and celebrities. New Jersey customers, all you need to do is wager at least $100 on WinBet Sportsbook or Casino. For New York customers, all you need to do is wager at least $100 on WinBet's sportsbook. The best part? You get an entry for every $100 you wager. Do you sense, being on the ground here, do you sense the excitement yeah, inside the building? Obvious. Yeah, I mean, you walk in. I mean, I, you know, Eric, I, I mean, that didn't feel like just training camp last year or the year before out there, you know, when I was out there today. And, and that's like, I mean... And it's not like this is the first day, you know, they're deep into camp sure. now and it's a weekday and they're still, it's still loud and there's still a ton of energy out there. And, you know, I think that that's a good sign like for where the team is. Like I, I don't know if they're going to win 13 games or six games, but it does seem like it's an engaged group. And I think one of the great things about, you know, the, when you bring in a quarterback like that, whether it's Favre or Brady or, you know, Manning or now Rogers is, I feel like when those guys change teams, the new team gets this added benefit, which is like everybody's at attention at all times mm -hmm. and every game matters. And I sort of think like the acquisition of Dalvin Cook plays into that. It's like, like Brees Hall is one of their best players. They could argue, I, and, and Garrett's awesome. <laughs> I'm maybe a little biased on Garrett because they want to get where he went to school, but um, Garrett is like, like but, but I think you could very easily make the argument when Brees went down, he was their best offensive player. Right. And, so, like, if you want to be careful with him coming back off the ACL over the first month of the season, well, it's hard to do that in an all-in type of year where, like, you can say what you will, there's a difference, like, right, like, where every single game counts from the start and you're worried about seeding from the start and it's like this year matters more than any other year that we've had here in a long time. And so you see, like, the acquisition of Dalvin Cook. Well, what does that do? It means, like, if you do want to be careful with Brees, you're not going to be tempted to pull the ripcord on him before he's ready for it, mm -hmm. you know? And that's not saying Brees won't be full go week one. It's just saying you're preparing yourself for those sorts of things. You have so, the opportunity to play the long game. Yeah, and there's an, like so like that's the attention thing. Like that's like we know like every single game that we have with this guy counts. And in the end, um, you know, the Bucks got what? It would have been 50 regular season games with Tom Brady. It was a roaring success because they won a championship. Yeah. And I think you could argue that he changed their franchise. And, you know, I think 
you know with a guy at that age, you're only going to get so many swings with that quarterback. The Jets don't know how many swings they're going to get with Aaron Rodgers, so you got to make the most of the swings that you get. And I think it, it permeates everything. You know what I mean? Like from the way the coaches work to the way the players work to the play, it's just to I, I it's this thing that's like it's hard to describe, but you know it when you see it. And I can remember it clear as day in Denver when 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 um, when Manning. when Peyton Manning was there, and uh, you know you go back to like Minnesota and the way. A lot of guys kind of like took off their careers, took off when far even far, defensive yeah. guys like I, if I remember right, Jared Allen like took another step as a pass rusher when Brett Favre got there. Why do you think that was? Let's say it's not because he's throwing him the ball. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, and obviously same with Brady in 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 Tampa. It's like, you know, you look at like how Chris Godwin's career took off when when Brady got there. You look at the way Demarius Thomas's career took off in Denver when Manning got there. Yeah. That's Eric, what you're looking for. That can be the multiplying effect of it. Eric Decker was out here at practice the other day. Mm-hmm. You talk about the sidelines, how they're full every day. Vinny Testaverde out here watching practice. Yeah, Decker's one of those guys who benefited from Manning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No doubt. He had a great year here with uh, Brandon Marshall. Yep. That was the last time the Jets were on the cusp of making the playoffs. You mentioned the running back position in Delvin Cook. So C- Cook enters the equation, and the Jets, if you got a healthy Cook, and you pair him up with a healthy Brees Hall. I mean, you still have Michael Carter here. Yeah. Who was so impressive as a rookie, and I think people forget what he can do. Uh, uh, Zonovan Bam Knight, and <laughs> we're talking about Israel Bonaconda. That running back, the yep. running back stay was right up there with anybody. Right, and that's like the that's why I think like the depth thing is really important. And you know, you look at like Tampa, like Tampa was okay at tight end. <laughs> they still went and got Gronk. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Like. Like, Denver was okay at receiver. They still went and got Emmanuel Sanders. They still went and got Wes Welker. You know, like, you look at the way these teams operate, and it's you can't leave anything to chance. You know, and I think that's part of, like, that whole attention thing is, like, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're going to be one short at, 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 at a spot. And because you've got that quarterback, you can attract veterans that you probably couldn't have attracted. You probably wouldn't have been able to attract the same way before. So you take advantage of that, you know, and um, I, you know, like it's you become you kind of become like like you've got like this, like this need again to fill out depth, at those spots and make sure that you're not going to be left shorthanded. And then like the quarterbacks, just his presence gives you the tool to do it. And that this is why you're going to come here. You're going to come here to play with this guy. And it works. It works. I mean, there's proof on the Jets roster right now like all the guys that want to play with Aaron like you know again there's a reason why Alan Lazard's here you think Mm. Randall Cobb's here or even playing at all if Aaron's not here um do you think maybe does Dwayne Brown come back for another year if Aaron's not here I mean I think so but like you know you like there's always that question like could he have been one that would have been like gotten to training camp and been like you know what I don't want to go through the rehab yeah so like there's all kinds of stuff like that so let's end here you're punchy right now you're, yeah. up, you're up at 4 o'clock in the morning. This is the 20th team you've seen. Uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on your Ohio State fellow alum, Garrett Wilson, yeah. and, and what's next for him and Sauce Gardner. Yeah, I think, like, the the benefit those two have of working against each other every day is phenomenal. And, you know, I think when Garrett came into the league, um, you know, he was obviously compared to, against the guy that he played with in Chris Olave. Mm. And, you know, I think that one thing that's been so great about this is, like, if you talk to people at Ohio State, what they would tell you is, like, Garrett, like, Chris was, like, a pro's pro when he was in college. And Garrett still had some growing up, too. Garrett was still, like, a college kid, you know? And, you know, I, I talk to people here about this now, and they're like, oh, his approach, like, he's such a competitor, and he's so locked in. He walks you around know. like a 10 year vet. Yeah, yeah. And like you see it like and so um, and I think part of it is like, you know, Aaron Rodgers is here now, you know, and not that it wasn't here last year. But so, I, I mean, I think the sky's the limit for him. The fact that he and Sauce are here together um, is phenomenal. You know what I mean? Like that they get to work against each other and push each other. It was fun watching them out there today. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think I always thought like like. Garrick sort of com- watching him at Ohio State. I always thought of like DeAndre Hopkins watching him. Mm. Um, some people have compared him to Stephon Diggs. 
Um, I think there's a good chance he's a top 10 receiver in the league. <laughs> I say that from an unbiased point of view, I promise. Like, I think he's a, there's a good chance he's a top 10 receiver in the league. And, you know, part of it's Aaron being here, but a part of it's what he's bringing to the table now. And I think some of his growth since um, he was drafted, whatever it was, 17 months ago. Uh, 14, 18, 16? I'm, I'm going to say, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say at the end of the day, he's going to be considered a top five receiver in the league. There you go. 1,100 yards. Well, you start receiving it as a off, rookie with four different quarterbacks. But you start, you start naming off guys, yeah. and it's like. I know. Right. You start going a deep list. Okay. All right. So, Albert Breer, SI.com, also Monday morning quarterback. You'll always have to read him to find out what's going on in the National Football League. Uh, thanks for your game effort out here, you despite got the lack of sleep. <laughs> All good. Thanks, Eric.